I, I have a bittersweet relationship with TV. <laughs> um, I loved, love, love, love my first, let's call it five years. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was truly able to teach football um, through a different medium. Former NFL quarterback and ESPN football analyst Trent Dilfer got honest with Adam Brenneman. TV got weird, man. It got people telling you what you should be talking about and what was important and what wasn't important. It wasn't about football all of a sudden. The politics and the buildings started determining what people got the chance to say what, where. Mm -hmm. um, it, if it was a hot button topic that Twitter at the time was trending on, then it made the front of the show, whether it was a premier game or not. Like all these other things mm -hmm. started creeping in. And that, with on top of me going from you know, the Bay Area in California on a red eye to New York and car servicing from New York to Bristol and then a flight to Monday Night Football and then a flight back to the West Coast and my daughter's now playing state championships and my one daughter at Notre Dame and I'm stopping off yeah. in South Bend before I went home and another one's at TCU and it just got overwhelming. Let's pause here. We're from Dilfer in a moment. I will say this. I know people who are in the industry that have had to go from one place to another weekly for years, okay? They have told me about the flights that they take out, the flights that they take to come back into the city, the limited time that they get to be with their family, the strains that puts on them and their family, it sucks. So when Dilfer says like, you know, he's catching the red eye and he's going coast to coast and he, you know, is, is doing a few things, but then he also has to do Monday Night Football. So then there's less days and whatnot. It is relatable if you care about your family, if you care about your inner circle. Career-wise, I also get it because it's understandable that you would want to maximize the amount that a media conglomerate a huge name, a multi-billion dollar corporation like ESPN would pay. But when he says it got overwhelming, it is so relatable because many in this field, I'm sorry, many outside of this field will say, well, he made millions off the NFL and then he made you know close to millions with ESPN. Yeah, I, I, I do get that and I wish I had that. But also when you get to that point, that you feel like you're not getting enough quality time in, it really dampens the entire mood and also your work-life balance. I, I, my favorite year was when I was doing Ray, Steve, and me. We're working together on Monday night. Well, then they're breaking up the band. The Stuart Scott mm -hmm. thing really hurt me. You know, he's a yeah. dear friend. I loved working with Stuart. I have some more funny memories with Stuart on the road than like that. That was a hard one to get over. So just things start piling up and uh, I didn't enjoy it. And it wasn't all the TV stuff, it was just the lifestyle. Um, and then I made some really stupid decisions. You know, I, I got involved in a contract negotiation um, that I should not have done looking back at it, and which made things weird with my bosses. And the la it just got funky at the end and it was better for everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that I was off TV and I'm sure the 50% that hated me are like, great, get him <laughs> off. But the next bald guy on, I mean, really all they did was trade me out for Hasselback, one of my best friends. <laughs> and now they've traded Hasselback out for Alex Smith, who's uh, I mentored in San Francisco. <laughs> like, I, I know that's a long winded answer, but I've never, really never had the platform to tell people either. Yeah. Um, I always said this when I was on TV. 50%, if you do your job well, 50% are going to love you. Yeah. They're just going to love you because connect with them, you teach them something, and there's always going to be 50% that hate you. Yeah. Um, those 50%, because you might tell them something about their team that they don't want to hear. Let's pause again. To me, what it sounds like here is that Trent Dilfer really did not appreciate the criticisms. Not that anyone does, let's be clear about this. But it sounds like the criticisms over uh, became overbearing and outweigh the positives of this situation. And that sucks. That sucks. Like, I mean, let, let's, let's be transparent here, okay? The amount of DMs and messages that I get 
and some of the comments that I receive, not cool. Not cool. There was a threatening message that was left for someone in my family who's one years old. That's not cool. Imagine that. Imagine that. Anything I say, which I have a right to do, but anything I say should not result in a threatening message to a toddler. But that's the world we're living in, isn't it? Where somehow it is acceptable for the masses to go and leave those sorts of comments. And I see it all, I see everything. There's a lot that I don't respond to. There are also those days where you feel like it's really difficult to keep going. So once again, I relate from awful announcing prior to his layoff, Dilfer reportedly sparred with ESPN NFL producer Seth Markman about his future with the company before eventually returning after he couldn't get the offer he expected from Fox Sports. Interestingly enough, Markman went to bat for Trent Dilfer during the 2016 NFL season after that reported confrontation, of course. Following his comments about Kaepernick and Bridges appeared to be well-mended. Years later, some details about that convo between Markman and Dilfer came to light of all places from Dan Lebetard. According to the host, Dilfer may have overplayed his hand when negotiating his contract and revealed he wanted a private plane because Kirk Herbstreet had one. Well, that is interesting, isn't it? I'll end with this. I truly feel like, and maybe this is just age speaking, but it always feels like we in our lifetimes experienced that golden era. Like, oh, those were the best years for the NBA. Those were the best years for the Chicago Bears. Those were the best years and golden years for cable television. And as we see this model shrinking and decreasing year over year, cord cutters, and not, not even just cord cutters, but people who don't even want to sign up for what is like the digital cord, I would call it, like Hulu or Sling or Roku, you know, YouTube TV, what have you. It's at and I think AT&T has one. We will never have this again. And Dilfer was in there a while ago. I would even go further back. And I would say the Rich Eisens, the Dan Patricks, the Stuart Scotts, the Keith Olbermans, like that is what I truly, truly believe were the golden years of ESPN. And they've been trying to recreate it over and over again. And it seems like they just keep kind of striking out. And that's not to say that they don't have good talent. They have incredible talent. The problem is people just don't need to pay for that cable box anymore. They just don't. They can get a login. They can create a login and pay X amount of dollars a month in comparison to what your cable provider will charge you, which is probably near what, 80 bucks, 100 bucks, 120 bucks, not counting internet. So Dilfer's Dimes will always be great. And it'll always be something I cherish. And to be honest with you, I wish Trent Dilfer the best of luck. I really do. I know that he's coaching football. I would like to see him get another analyst role. Uh, but as we know, the ball is in his court. If there are any stories we missed, if there are any that you would like to submit to me, get at me and follow me on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. DMs are open. Look forward to everyone's submissions there. And please, 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 if you can, support the network. Go to tyt.com slash join.